be in 1 Peter chapter 1. And, you know, what's interesting about 1 Peter chapter 1, as we get into the word here, you know, Peter was, a, was an interesting guy. How many of you know that he was known as the Apostle of Hope, right? The Apostle of Hope. If you study the New Testament, Paul the Apostle was known as the Apostle of Faith, right? See? But we know what's interesting is that faith and hope are very, very similar. Very similar. But this morning, we're going to take a closer look into hope. You know, what's interesting is I didn't even tell Pastor Trish, but she was playing a praise and worship song earlier, and it talked about our living hope, right? Peter talks about that. We're going to take a look at that right now, right? And I'm like, wow, she didn't even know that. And she played a song talking about the very thing we're going to look at this morning. What's interesting about the word hope, it's not the hope that you normally think about. Because, see, the hope that we understand defined by the dictionary is a feeling or an expectation, a desire for a certain thing to happen. That's what the dictionary defines hope as, a feeling of expectation and desire for a certain thing to happen, right? I hope the Dodgers win, <laughs> right? I hope they win. But what happens? They don't always win, right? We know that they were in first place for a while. What happened? They started losing ground, right? Yeah. <laughs> we have some non-Dodger fans in here, but that's okay, right? So we put our hope in things, but what happened? It's a feeling, it's an expectation for something to happen. I hope he asked me to marry him. Uh-oh. I hope something will happen, right? We, we put our, our hope in, into things. And what happens when it doesn't happen, right? We, we, we kind of get upset. We, we kind of, you know, we're not happy about the situation. See, but the Christian hope that Peter talks about here, and let's go to verse number 3, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse number 3. The word says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope. A living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Amen. See, Paul is calling that a living, or excuse me, Peter's saying it's a living hope. You know, if you have a King James Version, it may say, a lively hope. Well, what's the opposite of a living hope, a lively hope? A dead hope, right? So it's a living hope. And it's not wishful thinking, but a living reality rooted in the power of the one who was dead, but now lives. Right? See, Peter is saying, be hopeful. Be hopeful. That's what Peter is telling us. Why is Peter telling us to be hopeful? Well, you need to understand the context of this scripture. When, it was, when he wrote this, these, these scriptures, when he penned it down, it was 30 years after the death of our Lord Jesus Christ, after he had died and resurrected, went to heaven. Here it is 30 years later, and now Christianity has been spread through different parts of the world. And Peter is writing to a group of Christians that are in the Asia Minor area, which is known today as, as Turkey, right? There's a bunch of Christians that he's writing to because they have, are being persecuted by non-Christians. They're being persecuted by the government. And, and so he wants to encourage them, and he writes these words to them about where their hope should be, right? Where their hope should be, and, and this is what he's trying to tell them. Be hopeful. Sure, things don't look good right now. Sure, there's problems going on. But... Be hopeful. Now you may be thinking, oh, pastor, that's easy for you to say. You don't know what my situation is. You don't know my condition. No, I don't. God does. But the thing is this. Why are we focused on problems and situations instead of what the Lord has told us to put our focus on? And when we put our focus on everything else but Him, sure, we're not able to understand and see that there is something better waiting for us. Amen? So, today many people put their hope in everything else but God. Right? Many people put their hope in so many different things. 
But Peter's trying to tell us, put your hope in the Lord. That's what he's saying. Some people will put their hope in other people. And then when those other people walk out of their lives or leave their lives, they're devastated. Oh, what do I do? Right? Some people even find it hard to continue living or going on because of a person or a relationship that no longer exists. So where is your hope in a situation like that? Sure, we have relationships that we value and we put, you know, uh, we put value on, but they should not be our number one reason for living. Amen? See, our hope primarily, first and foremost, it should be on the Lord Jesus Christ. That is where we should put our hope in. Not in other people or even things. Because some people will put their trust and their hope in things. That's a whole nother message. Think about that. A living hope is one that has life in it and therefore can give life to us. Amen? Oh, thank you, Jesus. And because it has life, it can grow and it can become greater and more beautiful as time goes on, even if things aren't perfect in your life because your hope is on Him. But when our hope is in the wrong things or in the wrong people, right, we're, we're upside down. You know, it's sad when people lose hope. Anybody here read the paper besides me? Oh, I'm the only one? Okay. <laughs> this week, there was an article, matter of fact, it was probably a few days ago, that in the Rancho Cucamongo, excuse me, let me say this right, <sighs> getting tongue-tied. Back in the day growing up, it wasn't called Rancho Cucamonga, it was called Cucamonga, <laughs> right? I'll never forget one day, my friend, we were, I was about 18 years old, he had moved uh, uh, out of the area, and he said, can you give me a ride home? I said, well, where are you living? Cucamonga? I'm like, where's that at? He said, oh, it's just right up Foothill Boulevard. The 210 hadn't been connected here, that was years ago. But today it's called Rancho Cucamonga, right? Got a nice little more prettier twist to it. So there was an article this week that talked about in the Rancho Cucamonga School District in the month of August, which is not over yet. We're now in the last week, week of the month of August. But in the month of August, in the Rancho Cucamonga School District, four children have committed suicide. Three at El Taloma High School, one at an elementary school for a total of four children that have committed suicide this month. What is going on? What's happening? These are questions that parents in the school districts are asking themselves. What's going on? Why is this happening? I understand from a spiritual and a biblical perspective, they lost hope. They believed that their circumstances or situation were so dire that there was no hope and that that was the best solution for them for whatever it is they were going through. I can only imagine what parents are going through with these situations. But see, this is why we need to understand where hope needs to truly be. Amen? Let's go to the book of Romans chapter 8. We're going to go here to verse number 24. Romans eight twenty-four. Okay. And here in... Romans chapter 8, verse 24, look at what the Word of God says. It says right here, For we were saved in this hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For why does one still hope for what he sees? Verse 25, But if we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly wait for it with perseverance. 
See, Paul is telling us here that hope that is seen is not hope at all. We as believers, we hope in something that we can't see with the physical eyes. Amen? It's a spiritual thing is what we put our hope into. But see, even though we put our hope into something we can't see, does not mean that we're uh, being like hoping in, in something, uh, uh, I'm trying to think of the term here, uh, uh, a, a, we're, we're hoping for something to happen. No, we're not hoping for something to happen. We're putting our hope in a confident expectation is what we're doing. A confident expectation. Think about that. You don't have to turn there, but in Proverbs 23, 18, the contemporary English version says, then you will truly have hope for the future. Right? Then you will truly have hope for the future. See, think about this. Without hope, life loses its meaning. Life loses its meaning when there's no hope. The Word of God also tells us that hope is the anchor to our soul. And unfortunately, so many people, because of situations, circumstances beyond their control, will lose hope. Right? They lose hope. But see, our hope should not be in those things or in other people. Like Peter's telling us, our hope should be in the Lord. Amen? This is where our hope should be put into into the Lord. Think about that. You know, in Hebrews 6, 18, the Word of God says that God is not, not a man that He should lie. That's good news right there. Think about it. God cannot lie. It's not in His character to even lie. I don't know about you, but as a child, lying came naturally to me, right? Did you eat that cookie? Nope. <laughs> wasn't me. Crumbs all over your mouth. No, it wasn't me. I didn't go in the cookie jar, right? Lying came naturally to us. But think about it. Think about this. God is not a man that he should lie. Hebrews 6.18, for those of you who are taking notes. God is not a man that he should lie. That's good news right there. Because that means when we study God's word, these scriptures, right? Yes, they were written by uh, many different people that were inspired by God. God gave them the words to pin down, right? So therefore, God cannot lie. So when we read the scriptures, we have to know, and we have to have that confident expectation that this is truth right here, right? This is truth. This, this is not something that is a fairy tale. This is not something that we have to, you know, uh, uh, I hope it's true. No, it is true. Amen? Because God is not a man that he should lie. And so we need to understand that our hope should not be placed in all these other things or people because they will let us down. If you're a Dodgers fan... You're going to be let down sometimes, right? You're going to be let down. How many of you remember last year? They went, went to the World Series, right? The World Series. That is the epitome, right, of, you know, a, a baseball player's career to make it to the championship game, to say that they are the best, right? And they took it to game seven, for those of you who don't know about baseball, the World Series is comprised of whoever wins the best out of seven, meaning whoever wins the first four games first. And it went to game seven, which meant both teams had won three games each, so it went to a seventh game, the deciding game. And, man, those games were really good. Even the seventh game, yes, the Dodgers lost. They didn't win. But if you were just a fan of baseball, whether you were rooting for another team who didn't make it to the playoffs, you would have said, man, that was a good World Series. Wow, that was some great baseball. Because the game kept going back and forth. One team was winning, then the, uh, Houston was winning, then the Dodgers were winning. It was just going back and forth, back and forth. And it was looking like, oh, they're going to win it. No, they're not going to win it. Oh, they're going to win it. Nope. It was just, wow. 
But see, sure, if you're a, a fan of a certain team or a game, you want your team to win. But if they don't win, you know, we shouldn't go out and, oh, life's over, right? And some people, they get very drastic. They'll go burn all their stuff, right? Right? Some fans, they'll even go want to pick a fight with the opposing team's fans because they lost. That's poor sportsmanship right there, right? But where should our hope be, amen? It should be in the Lord. Now, let's go to 1 Peter chapter 1 again, and we're going to go here to verse number 4 now. Now, look at what Peter is telling us here. We're going to 1 Peter chapter 1, where we started, but now... We're going to move on from verse number three, and we're going to go to verse number four. So in verse number three, Peter says that we should have a living hope, is what he's telling us. And then in verse four, look at what he says. He says, to an inheritance incorruptible, undefiled, and that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you. In other words, what Paul is calling hope, he's saying that's an inheritance God has given you. What? Yes. See, this inheritance that, that God is giving us, it's unlike an earthly inheritance. Why is it unlike an earthly inheritance? Because if any of you have ever got anything through an inheritance, meaning uh, a family member passed on and they left you their favorite pair of shoes. Well, those shoes ain't going to last forever if you wear them. Now, maybe if you leave them in the shoe box in the closet... Yeah, they might last longer. But if you actually take those babies out and start wearing them, the lifespan is going to go away very quickly, right? But the thing is this. An earthly inheritance is different from an inheritance from God. And what God, or, or Peter's telling us is that hope is an inheritance that God has given us. And he goes on to say that this inheritance in verse 4 is incorruptible, right? What does that mean? It means nothing can ruin it. That's good news right there. Nothing can ruin what God has given you with this inheritance of hope. And then he goes on to say it's undefiled, meaning nothing can stain it or, 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 or uh, let me see here. It cannot be stained or, I'm trying to think of a word here. It can't be messed up in any way right? Undefiled. Think about that. Wow. You mean God has given us an inheritance? Yes. But this inheritance of hope is something that gives us the ability to, to continue to trust Him and to look for something better than what we're experiencing now. Amen? Think about that. See, Peter goes on to tell us, if you read on in the next verses, uh, you know, I would say read up to maybe verse 12 when you get some time. He goes on to tell us that, that nothing, you know, that, that hope can endure even when you go through trials. Think about that. What is a trial? A trial is something where life gets a little challenging, a little difficult, right? A trial is when you're going through something. And he's telling us that hope can help you to even rejoice when you're going through trials. Because think about it. Whatever it is you're going through, it's not forever. It's temporary. See, that's the, that's the good news. Trials don't last forever, but maybe for a season. Right? A season. Anybody ever heard of an uh, old preacher during the late 1800s, named Charles Spurgeon, right? Look at what Char Charles Spurgeon says. He used to say, Little faith will take your soul to heaven, but great faith will bring heaven to your soul. That's good right there, right? That's real good right there. Think about that. Little faith will take your soul to heaven, but, but great faith, Faith will bring heaven to your soul, right? What are we putting our hope into? So in other words, whatever it is we go through in life, we can still walk with a smile on our face regardless of what it is we're going through because 
really, where does our hope lie? You know, right? Where, where does our hope lie? Going back to verse number three, what Peter said is that God has given us a living hope, and that's through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Amen? See, he's given us a living hope. Right? The opposite of dead. Think about that. He's telling us, be hopeful. Be hopeful. No matter what it is that you may be facing, be hopeful. Don't lose hope. Nothing is that bad where you got to lose hope. Yep, nothing is that bad. Even leaving this earth, losing our lives because we go on to something better amen we go on to something better so not even death is something that we should frown upon see if you if you really know our heavenly father if you have a strong relationship with the lord you should know that death is not something that that you should fear or something that you should dread because there's so many promises God gives us to when we leave this earth. And he tells us that a lot of the things that we deal with here on planet earth, we're not going to deal with when we get to the next destination. Man, there's so many things to look forward to. But remember this. While we're here on this earth, God's got a plan and a purpose for each and every one of us that he would like us to accomplish. So he's got work for us to do, amen? Amen. And so, the, the, you know, the, the thing about it is, sure, there's something greater waiting for us after this life on earth is finished with, but God still wants us to accomplish that task he's given us. Don't leave earth before it's your time. Because, see, some people, they want to check out too soon, right? Anybody ever check into a hotel, a motel, right? They have checkout times right? I don't know about you, but I always ask for a late checkout time because I like to sleep in. I'm a, I'm a night owl, right? Pastor Trisha uh, and I like staying up late and we like sleeping in late when we can, right? So when we go somewhere, you know, we're not that person that's up at five o'clock and, you know, at the restaurant eating breakfast by six o'clock. That's not us. You're going to go by our room, you're going to hear some snoring till probably about 10 o'clock, Right? Now, if we got to check out at 11, which that's probably the average checkout time in hotels, motels, right? We'll kindly ask, can we get a late checkout? Right? And most of the time, they'll, they'll, uh, uh, they'll accommodate you. They'll say, you know what? You can check out at noon. We're like, that'll work for us. And all that means is they'll let the cleaning people know, clean that room last. Don't go to their room till, till the end. We're letting them sleep in a little bit. Isn't it nice to get a late checkout, Right? not having to check out early. Don't check out of this life earlier than what God has planned for you to check out. And I know some people are thinking, oh, pastor, you don't understand. You don't understand what I'm going through. You don't understand what I'm dealing with. No, I don't understand, but God does. And you know what God says? When you take your focus off of all those things and put them on him, you're not so concerned about those things. You're not so concerned about it, right? Think about it. When we put our focus on him, we put our hope on him and take it off of ourselves and we take it off of other things and other people, wow, we're able to, you know, breathe a little bit better when we start to put the focus on him. Amen? God is good. He's given us an inheritance that's incorruptible, undefiled, Right? Think about that. Incorruptible. Nothing can ruin it. Undefiled. Can't be stained. Wow. Isn't God good? Thank you, Jesus. Now, some people may ask, well, how does God put hope in our hearts? I need some hope. Let's go to verse 23. We're still in 1 Peter. Let's go to verse 23. Because I know some of you are probably thinking, well, how do we get this hope? Because I need some. Verse 23, 1 Peter. Having been born again, not of corruptible seed, 
but incorruptible through the word of God, which lives and abides forever. What is Peter telling us? Peter's telling us is that we're born to a living hope. This is where it arises from. When we put our trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, right? That's being born again, spiritually born, right? Hope has been deposited inside of us, amen? So you have it. But what happens is, is that we sometimes focus on the wrong things. But Peter's here to remind us, right, that you have hope right here. He tells us, who, verse right here, verse 20, what did I tell you it was? 23? Having been born again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible through the word of God, which lives and abides forever. Who's the word of God? Uh-oh. Jesus is the word of God. You never heard that? Oh, okay. We're gonna have to we're gonna have to show you something here. Let's go back to First John chapter uh, five. Just a little side uh, journey here before we close. First John chapter five. Go towards the end of the New Testament, right before Revelations. Go to First John, one John chapter five, and we're gonna go to verse number seven. If you didn't know that. Jesus is the Word of God. Look at what the Word shows us here in 1 John 5, 7. It says, There are three that bear witness in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit, and these three are one. Pastor, I thought it was the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. It is. Jesus is the Son, but He's also the Word. The Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit, these three are one. You still confused? Okay, let's go to the Gospel of John, chapter 1. Gospel of John, go to your left. Right after the book of Luke, John, chapter 1. Jesus is the Word of God. John, chapter 1, verse 1. Look at what the Word shows us here. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Still don't believe me? Okay, go, go to verse 14. And the Word became flesh. You see that? And dwelt among us. Who dwelt among us? Jesus. And we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father. Who's the only begotten of the Father? Jesus, full of grace and truth. Jesus is the Word of God. Amen? Jesus is the Word of God. And this is what we put our hope into, into Him. Amen? We put our hope into Him. So as we get ready to leave this morning, yes, I know life is hard. Anybody here who lives on planet Earth will go through some things. Nobody is exempt. Problems come everybody's way. There's not a person that lives on this Earth or who has ever lived on this Earth that never experience problems, that never experience heartache, and the list goes on. But what will help us endure and get through those things is a hope in the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen? Yes, oh, thank you, Lord Jesus. Let's put our hope in Him. Amen? Let's learn to take our focus off of ourselves and our situations and circumstances and start looking at Him a little bit more. And as you do that, those things are not going to be so big they start to actually look a little smaller. Because why? Because you're not focused on them, amen? Oh, thank you, Lord Jesus. If I can have everyone just bow their heads and close their eyes as we get ready to dismiss, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time. We give you glory and we give you honor. Oh, Lord, we thank you for the hope that you've given us, that inheritance that's incorruptible and undefiled. Oh, Lord, we thank you that we will place our hope in you. And although things may get difficult at times, things may get challenging, Lord, we ask that you help us focus on you and not on those things or those situations 
Oh, Lord, help us to finish our race and to finish strong. Oh, Lord, we give you glory and we give you honor. In the precious name of Jesus, and everyone says, Amen, amen and amen. Isn't God good?